David is, will be sharing his passion with us with the topic, Does Civic Education Have a Future? Please join me in giving David Bob a warm Packerderm Club welcome. An important question that we're going to talk about today, and I want to make this very much a conversation and, and uh, hear your thoughts and, and ideas. To ask the question, does civic education have a future, is to ask the, the question, does the Constitution have a future? And to ask that question is to realize just what a state of affairs we're at in this country. Because I think it's a, a, a very going concern as to whether, in fact, we wish to maintain a fidelity to the Constitution and what shape that Constitution is going to be in. You know, a recent poll uh, done by the place that uh, James Madison called home, Montpelier, canvassed uh, young people and it asked them various questions about their kind of political attitudes and their uh, opinions about uh, civic engagement and, and one of the questions was basically along the lines of do you think we ought to stick with the Constitution or would you be okay with leaving it behind. About 40% of those who are between the age of 18 and 24 said that they could just as well do without the Constitution, scrap it and start over. Another recent uh, study revealed, there's been a lot of uh, talk about the Supreme Court recently, of course, with the passing of Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, but 10% of our fellow citizens across the land thought that Judge Judy was one of the members of that esteemed tribunal. Now I'm sure you've all seen the man on the street interviews and you see those and we can chuckle and then you kind of want to weep and then you wonder well what do we do? And the organization where I've been uh, just thrilled to uh, serve as president for the last two years, the Bill of Rights Institute, has for the last 16 years been one of the answers to that question. And over the course of my remarks this uh, afternoon with you, I'd, I'd love to share some of the things that we're doing, including this textbook, which I'm happy to report is being utilized by 13,000 teachers across the country. Now there's about 220,000 secondary school teachers in the land, those who are focused on teaching these subjects. Civics, American government, American history and history uh, of, of the world, and then also we, we, we include economics. There are some teachers that still are referred to as civics teachers, though I have to report that there are not as many civics courses as there were even a decade or 20 or 30 years ago. But maybe just out of a, uh, a bit of curiosity, how many people in this room had a course, say in high school or junior high school, uh, that, was, that, that, that actually had the name civics? Okay. So the very definition there, civics, the very word, comes from the idea of the kivis, the, ci the, 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 the city in which you live. And it's the idea of citizenship that so often I think we're abjectly failing at teaching. Now sometimes when we think of, well, what should be in a civics course, and after all, how important can one course be? What I want to really emphasize today is that it's not just about the revival of that thing that happens in the classroom. Because that's important, there's no doubt about it, that those lessons that you can learn in the hands of a really great teacher can make history come alive in a way that informs how you should be, how an individual student should be. But citizenship as of late has been defined by really two things, and that's a kind of uh, emphasis on voting and recycling. <laughs> That's where students very often are getting a sense of, of, uh, of, of, of civic education. And if you go on YouTube, which is where most 16 and 17 year olds spend a lot of their time, 15 year olds for that matter, 14, 13, right? A lot of, a lot of uh, looking down, they've even been dubbed the looking down generation, I think that's a little harsh. But YouTube and you search for the word civics, you know what you pull up? Honda civics that are used for drag racing. <laughs> Very often if you go to Twitter, which is another place where a lot of young people hang out, you find civics with the corresponding hashtag boring. <laughs> 
And you know what? I have to agree with a lot of the students on that case. Civics too often has become this thing that is really kind of boring. It's two-dimensional at best. It kind of presents these charts. You might remember them from your class, the separation of powers, right? You see the three branches of government. Congress even publishes something. I got a kick out of this. I did some work on the Hill, uh, working in an educational capacity with members of Congress. Uh, I can tell you that working with fifth graders is very often uh, easier uh, than working with members of Congress when it comes to talking about the Constitution. But uh, the, the, the thing that you, you, you so often uh, see is, is that there's a kind of lip service paid to the Constitution, but it's more about the kind of formulaic approach. So Congress has a publication called How, Our, How a Bill Becomes a Law. And it's about 70 or 80 pages of the kind of steps that procedurally a bill has to go through. But that doesn't tell the real story. For there are a lot of really interesting things, important things to know about how a bill actually becomes a law. And that story, and the story of not just that aspect of our civic life, but think of what it has been in the creation of this country. How did we come to the place that we are? How did we start off? What was the American Revolution about? All of those kind of questions are part and parcel of what a strong civic education should do. The other vital aspect of civic education that's really neglected is the character. For after all, schools, whether they want to admit it or not, over the course of, say, 13 years, tack on another four years at college, and you have 17 years of education, they are shaping the hearts and minds of young people. They are imparting values. And our message to the teachers with whom we work across the land and to young people is that the character that they have, the decisions that they make every day, define this country in a really important way. And therefore, we make an argument that they should be people of moral virtue. How do you become a person of moral virtue? Well, this is where history comes into play, I think. Because we have so many examples before us, and living today, of those individuals who have had to struggle mightily to become human beings of high moral integrity, of responsibility, of self-government, self-governing individuals. That's a really hard thing. You know, take George Washington, for example. We think of him as a kind of man of pre-made perfection, right? In the District of Columbia, he's represented, after all, by an obelisk. He seems as hard to relate to as that monument sometimes. And so Parson Weems and others tried to humanize him by telling the story of the cherry tree state. I cannot tell a lie. And they painted him as a kind of individual that, that never made any mistakes in that sense. And you know, that was not George Washington. George Washington, as a young man, struggled mightily with vanity. He rather liked the way he looked in his military uniform. I tell my students he probably would have been all over Instagram with selfies. <laughs> uh, and I'm not, I'm not joking there, right? He was very proud of that. He was a man of absolutely uh, kind of a sky-high ambition. He was absolutely on fire to be famous. He wanted to make an impact. And in his early life, he was too rash in the way that he conducted himself. You know, he touched off through his actions in the French and Indian War a global conflagration. That was George Washington as a young person. And I didn't even mention the fact that he had a volcanic temper. How did he deal with all of those things? Well, he came to realize that unless he was ambitious for the right things, he was going to continue in a way that was going to be counterproductive to the good of the whole. He might be able to propel himself into a place of fame, fortune, renown. But the question was, what good was he going to do for his people? What lasting good was he going to do? 
And so as Washington matured in his 20s and he gained more responsibility, and he came into some even setbacks, you know, he, he lost his first election. He came to realize that he was going to have to discipline himself, tame those passions that otherwise could run amok, and become a man of real principle. And he said, I am going to put on character, much like an actor might take on a different persona. The idea was that you would put on character. And he looked to people from the ancient past, individuals like the Roman general Cincinnatus, who was willing to assume dictatorial authority, but then put down the sword, return to the plowshare. George Washington became the American Cincinnatus because when entrusted with nearly absolute power or what could have been, do you know that during the, con during the Revolutionary War there were times that Congress designated him dictator, right? The same plenary authority that the Roman dictator would get. And Washington yet conform, con sort of uh, confined himself to the role that otherwise he would have uh, taken had he not been given that authority. He didn't run pell-mell into saying, I'm going to just run over Congress's will. Think of those hundreds of letters that he wrote Congress begging them for allocating money so that he could pay his troops. Given the opportunity, and there were plenty of them, he could have assumed much greater authority to the point where I do think that it would have been possible for him to assume a kind of monarchical role in this country. If he gives up power, King George III said, he will be the greatest. He did and he was. He gave up the power. On December, 7, no, December 15, 1783, after being gone from Mount Vernon for a stretch that was longer than 3,000 days, he returned twice during that time, one of which was to tend to a death in uh, uh, the, the family of Martha. The other was to have a meeting with a French general at Mount Vernon. Think of that time span. At the end of that period, he went to Annapolis and he submitted his letter of resignation, which was effectively putting down the sword. And it was not a show of false humility, but of real humility, because he could have seized much greater power. And he was pulled back onto the national scene only upon the pleadings of his fellow founders when it came time to craft the Constitution. He assumed the role then of president of that uh, convening body of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. And then by unanimous vote, he was elected into the office that was designed in large measure with him in mind. But you know, the founders were far seeing enough that even though they knew that George Washington was going to be the first president of the United States, as they deliberated about that office, they knew that we would not always have a George Washington. Enlightened statesman, Publius wrote, will not always be at the helm. Today, as we think before us and have a choice, who will be the next commander in chief? We are wise, I think, to look back to that example of George Washington. And in the education that we give our young people, you know, what they learn about George Washington today is usually two things. He owned slaves, and he had wooden teeth. The second thing is incorrect, and the first thing is not giving the fullness of the story. For it is true that George Washington and two-thirds of the signers of the Declaration of Independence did own slaves. And that's a question that we spend a lot of time with at the Bill of Rights Institute. We pose that question to our teachers. I bring it up with students. Our entire teaching faculty brings that up with students, and we put it front and center in our curriculum. But we do so to raise it as a question and to say, how are we to understand this contradiction in terms that the very men and women who were crying most for liberty enslaved other human beings? Most textbooks and most treatments of this stop at that, and they have a kind of indictment. And they say, because the founders held slaves, we shouldn't pay any attention to the rest of what they did. And in fact, some of those university protests that we've seen, some 50 in number over the last couple of months, 
have been oriented around the idea that people like Thomas Jefferson and other slave owners need to have their statues literally knocked over. What we do with students is we ask them to consider what were the laws of the day? What were the circumstances in which most of those founders felt themselves in the possession of slaves? As with Washington, many of them inherited them. What did they do then once having found themselves in that position? Well, some were imprudent in their own finances. They spent their money in other places. Washington, for him, it was very important that upon the death of his widow, Martha, her slaves and his would be manumitted. And in his will and testament, he prescribed the, ex ex the executors of his estate to with particular faith attend to the education and needs of those slaves that were going to be released from Mount Vernon. And that existed until the 1830s, that fund that provided for those slaves. Now, if you're like the city of New Orleans did a number of years ago, and you say that any person that held slaves will not have a school named after him or her, what you are doing then when you strip George Washington Public Elementary School of that name is giving those students an incomplete understanding of who he was and what he stood for. Not only that, but what you do is you commit the error of retrojecting a view that we have today, or that was held, I should say, much later in American history and pushing it back onto the founders. And that is this, that they were all racist. Because to an individual, all of the founders believed that slavery was a grave evil. It was a violation of justice. Even Thomas Jefferson, who in his own finances didn't provide for the means of, of uh, the, the manumission of his uh, more than 300 slaves, said, when I think of this matter and I reflect that God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever, I tremble. In other words, this issue is of immense complexity. It can't be boiled down to a backhanded dismissal of an entire generation of individuals who gave up so much so that they could set in place for the first time in human history the means by which slavery could be extirpated from our land. In other words, no other group of individuals, no other person had come up with the formulation, the idea that you should start a regime based on the idea that human beings have rights, that those rights come to us not because we're of a particular bloodline or we believe a particular religion or that we know the right people. We have those rights because they are in, that we are endowed by our Creator with those rights. That among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And when you make that the foundation of your regime, you are doing something entirely new. Never before in the history of the world had something been done like that. That sets a standard then. And that standard says that enslaving human beings is wrong everywhere and always. And it paved the way so that eventually, as Abraham Lincoln said, slavery could be made extinct. One of the things that I think when you reflect on what we know about American history, it's so hard to convey to young people that the founders weren't sitting around kind of at the time saying, isn't it great being the founders? Right? They worried. They wondered, is what we're doing actually going to succeed? Does it have any hope of sticking? Does it have any possibility of surviving even their lifetime? You know, every day now, there are about a thousand individuals who fought, for, fought in uh, World War II who passed from uh, this place to the beyond. We lose a thousand veterans every day. In the year 1819, a similar thing was happening as those who fought in the American Revolution were passing from the scene. John Adams received a letter from somebody, 
an individual named Hezekiah Niles. And the letter was, can you reflect back on what you did? What was the American Revolution really about? And Adams took this letter and he gave it real thought because he, he, he thought, this is a serious question. Because once we lose that generation who actually fought in the thing, will we remember what it was that they were fighting for? Adams' response was really interesting. He said, what we fought for was a radical change in the opinions, sentiments, and ideas that the American people held. And he used that word radical. Now, I wasn't thinking radical here kind of like college student with Che Guevara poster on the wall, right? That's kind of what we think about with, with the idea of radical. You know, the people that are showing up for Bernie Sanders rallies, maybe, protesting the WTO, fulminating against the, the, the powers that be. Radical means something to Adams and to those that know its Latin root, which is the word root. Radix, right? It points you back to the root of the thing. And that's what Adams is saying, that the American Revolution was pointing back to the foundational things, to things of human nature, that we have rights, and that that understanding of rights is going to be at the core of what we do as a country. And Adams's uh, appeal to his interlocutor was, don't forget this. Pass it on. Teach this thing. Because if we don't, people are going to forget. It's that kind of approach that we try to take at the Bill of Rights Institute. So that civics isn't just this dry as dust, reciting of facts and dates that taken together don't come to mean anything. You know, there are 450,000 students every year among the brightest in this country that take the advanced placement US history exam. There's been a lot of controversy about this exam as of late because the college board, which runs uh, all of the advanced placement tests, including this one, instituted some new guidelines. They went from a five-page outline that teachers would get for constructing their courses in advanced placement US history to one that runs to over 100 pages. Now that's a really tough outline to grasp for anything, right? But notwithstanding the controversy about how many times different people are cited, because I think that kind of misses the, the main point, you can, in a textbook, talk about James Madison or Thomas Edison, the question is, what do you say about them? What point do you make? And most importantly, what do students know about these individuals? And what we do at the Bill of Rights Institute in the video that, that uh, we played at the outset is our effort at using and, and pulling together primary source documents as a textbook. You know, textbooks by uh, a general rule are written by committee members. They're not very interesting because of that. They don't have a voice, right? Think of the books that you love to pick up if you're a lover of history. David McCullough, perhaps, right? Others that, that uh, even have inspired, uh, of all things, a Broadway musical about Alexander Hamilton's life, right? Who would have thought that that would have been uh, really popular? But that's currently the hottest ticket on Broadway. When you pick up a great piece of history writing, it tells a story. It relates the struggle that happened, for nothing great happens without a struggle. And that's too often what we fail to do, whether it's in AP US history or in any of the other courses. And so we think that by orienting students and teachers to primary source documents, by asking them to really confront, say, the Declaration of Independence, go through that text, Read the Federalist Papers with your students. Yes, the language is really hard, but it pays dividends over the long haul. By asking them to read the letters, I don't know if any of you have ever read the correspondence between John Adams and his wife Abigail, but they're really beautiful. They were separated for so much of their marriage, 10 out of the first 20 years, that we have the largest surviving uh, collection of letters of any couple at the American Revolution. And it happened to be one of the most interesting and amazing couples that you'll find in any era of history.
Put those things before students and you see the entire debate shift. For then, they're being invited to come into and be part of a conversation. They have to do a lot of learning. I'm not suggesting that content knowledge is not important, for it is absolutely vital. To think clearly about history, you have to know dates and places and people and battles. You have to have some sort of historical consciousness and memory. Even if you haven't been there, you have to be able to place these things in a timeline, right? So many of our students do not even know and cannot place the Civil War, for example, within the right century that it would really surprise you. So once you do that, you shift the conversation. And it can really enrich the, the, the discourse. And then inform the debates of today. So for example, a couple of days ago, we sent out a piece to our teachers about the legacy of Justice Antonin Scalia. And we used sources ranging from the New York Times to the Atlantic to other commentary pieces on what Scalia's legacy was. And we did lots of point-counterpoint, where teachers would come to an understanding of what is textualism? What is originalism? What were those things that Scalia pioneered in his own writing? But the main thing that we pointed to were the key decisions in which he was either uh, writing for the majority, or perhaps even more famously, he was a dissenter. And excerpting those things gives students an opportunity then to confront the language and the ideas that Justice Scalia stood for. Now I think one of the strange things and one of the, the, the problems that we're seeing today in the crisis of civic education is evident in look at the national debate about how Justice Scalia's seat ought to be filled. People are kind of reaching for their constitutions. That's a good thing, right? Trying to figure out what does the Constitution have to say about a Supreme Court vacancy? What is the prerogative of the president? What is the role of the United States Senate? All of those things that were hammered out with such meticulous care at the Constitutional Convention are so little known today that we have everybody kind of spouting off on their own opinion about what ought to happen, with not a lot of attention to history, precedent, or the constitutional structure. Why would they separate out? One of the school's uh, students asked an interesting question. Why would they separate it out? Why wouldn't they just give the Senate the power um, wouldn't, wouldn't that be more representative of the popular will? Well, good question. The idea that we might want to stymie the popular will in some sense, slow it down, is kind of anathema to today's sense of where we ought to be. But in fact, it's not will that ought to rule the day, but reason. And the idea behind the separation of powers and behind checks and balances <coughs> And behind the coordinate construction, which is that every one of the three branches reports to the Constitution, as it were. You know, a lot of people think that it's kind of the court that sits atop the other two branches, and it's kind of a triangle. Or that, as commonly, the president sits atop the other two. In fact, all three branches of government are coordinate. And it's the Constitution to which each one of the members of those three branches takes an oath. The question then is answered best, I think, by looking to the idea that we need reason. And the way that we get to reason is by filtering it a lot. The founders weren't oblivious to the possibility of having a national plebiscite. Right? We think, well, we have such great technology now, why don't we just put everything to a vote? We could vote up or down on each issue save a lot of time and, and, and money, and, and uh, everybody from Ross Perot to a lot of other folks have said that's the kind of government that we ought to have. For the founders, that kind of democracy was precisely the problem that they needed to avoid. A Republican form of government is different than that, for it says the people are represented, and through our representation, the people's will will be shifted, one hopes, to the place of rational discourse and deliberation. One of the things when I uh, would bring college students to Washington, D.C. 
and see their uh, eyes open sort of over the course of an internship program over a semester or a full year. They'd always have this kind of moment when they'd go to, to, to watch the House of Representatives in action. And they kind of expected to see Mr. Smith goes to Washington type uh, debates. And then they'd show up and they'd see a single member usually, maybe a couple others in the, in, in the audience, talking to an entirely empty chamber. And the same thing happens in the world's greatest deliberative body, the United States Senate. And you know, there's one member of that body now, Senator Ben Sass from Nebraska, and he's decided to do an interesting thing. He works out of the Senate chamber because he got so tired of the idea that people could go in there and make their speeches and have nobody ever challenge him that now he'll set up with his laptop in the chamber and he'll just be working away and when somebody makes a speech he'll raise a point of, uh, point of uh, information, a point of query, right? And he'll interrupt them and then they're kind of startled, right? And they realize that, hey, we might have a debate on our hands. It's those skills so often that also have been lost in this country. And so what we're focusing on, even as we root our discourse in the primary source documents and history, is to invite students to have debates and debate the issues of the day, things that are going to be important in their lives, like the minimum wage. They tell us also that things are very um, about the national economy or of great significance to them. Right? They may not have put together at the age of 16 exactly how everything works together, but they can surely feel that this thing that's come to be known as the gig economy um, has had deleterious effects on their brothers and sisters, their older brothers and sisters, and they're worried about it themselves. What does it mean to try to land a job now? Whether it's the summer or, say, after college. And so what we're asking kids to do is to, armed with information and armed with some of the, um, the, the, the kind of grounding that they can get in the American founding and that perspective on the Constitution, is come to some of the current debates and apply those. So for, for example, we asked students to debate the issue of free speech on campus. Should we have speech codes? You know, a very large percentage of students now have no problem at all with the idea that there should be speech codes. And that we ought to say there are certain limitations on what you can and cannot say on the campus of public universities. 40, 50, some even show 60% support for various uh, restrictions on free speech. That's a pretty clear indicator that the idea behind the First Amendment and the First Amendment itself have not been taught. Or at least if they've been taught, they've been taught in a very different way. And in fact, that very often is the case. That you can put a very different gloss on these things. And you can go back and say, just like those Historians do, like Howard Zinn, say of the American founding, look, it was guns and greed. And we've seen no improvement since then in the way that we treat our citizens. It's always about the powerful and the privileged. And for somebody like Bernie Sanders, Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky are kind of patron saints of progressivism. Stuff that used to be on the margins is now going much more mainstream. This isn't a thing that's unique to the Democratic Party. I think that the idea of the Constitution being our lodestar has come a long ways uh, and, and unfortunately is far removed from much of both of our political parties. For there's a different kind of mentality that would say, we'll pay lip service to the Constitution, but when push comes to shove, we can find a different way. We can hammer out a different compromise. We can set aside some of those principles so that very soon we can rescue those principles, right? We need to move away from the free market for a bit, President George W. Bush said, so that we can save the free market. So there's a kind of crisis of civic education in the country but the good news, I would say, is that there are lots of people that are working alongside our organization and who care both at the high school level, at the level of middle school and also elementary grades, and then moving up from where we're working in the college and university level. 
And what we're trying to really stitch together is a national coalition of people who really care about this thing called civics. And to say that we can redefine the means by which we convey this information, taking advantage of the technologies that are available to us, but also recognizing that the knowledge of these things is really important. And perhaps most important of all is the way that the students are going to be. Who are they going to be as individuals? How are they going to relate to their communities? Are they going to become men and women of character, willing to take those hard stands, those hard positions, and stick with them, stick by those principles? That's the uh, mission, that's the work that we're doing. I'll stop there and, and would welcome your comments, ideas, questions, and if there are schools, by the way, that you all are involved in, or if you sit on a school board or involved in the community, I'd love to learn more about what you're doing and how uh, we at the Bill of Rights Institute uh, can, can, can uh, help you. Yeah, yes, you sir. mentioned that they were talking about taking names off the of schools of slave owners. Here in Wichita, we took down the Confederate battle flag from a veterans memorial. Would you compare that or contrast it with ISIS and their destruction of buildings and monuments over in their territory? Yeah, that's an interesting comparison. I think there's, there's a lot at work in the way that we teach the, uh, the, the Civil War. And, and I was surprised, I have to say, that, that even for those kind of things like, because it's, it's one thing, I think, to debate whether the uh, um, Confederate battle flag should fly over the South Carolina legislature. Right? And I think we might have differing uh, views on that in this room if we were to have the debate. But there's another thing to sort of suggest that it never, and the Confederacy never existed. And that we should sort of take and push down the memory hole any recollection of the fact that there were men who died for that cause and that there was a legitimate and prolonged and bitter and awful struggle in this country. And that to teach that thing and to understand the full contours of what that struggle was about is very important. And so one of the things that we're looking to develop much more in our curricular approach is uh, not only a, a focus on military history, but to go back to some of the great conflicts of our, uh, of our American history and really do a deep dive with students. Because so often um, what they do is they get one perspective and that kind of so drives the narrative of a textbook that they know that to take the other side, whatever that other side might be, is just kind of silly. In other words, you don't have to come to grips with anything that you don't want to believe. And that's just doing a disservice to our young people. For what they should understand is, what was that war really about? Was it a war of northern aggression? What was at stake? What were the economics of the, of the day? What was the context in which uh, uh, the uh, the secession uh, movement sprang up. What was the role of slavery? And to look at all of that very clearly and carefully, and then to be able to unpack it. But too often what we do is we presume that we know the, op the right opinion, and we ask students to share with us their feelings about that opinion. And honestly, when students turn in a paper and they write, I feel this way, I would usually turn it back in and say, I don't really care how you feel. Right? I mean, I do in a way, but it has to be an informed opinion. And after all, education is about moving from opinion to knowledge. And like that decision in New Orleans, which I think is so short-sighted, I think we're making a lot of other decisions that are, uh, that are similarly short-sighted and that we're missing an opportunity here to really uh, go back and, and understand just was, what was at stake in these, uh, in these debates. Because what ISIS is trying to do is to say that we can create the world anew. And that's a kind of tendency, I think, that we've seen many times in human history. We saw it at work in the, uh, uh, in the Russian Revolution. We saw it at work in the French Revolution, right? Where the Jacobins said, not only are we going to win a victory in this war, but once we do, we're going to proclaim that it's year one, right? We're gonna throw out the old calendar. Proclaim a new age. We saw what that kind of proclaiming of new ages meant in the 20th century. It resulted in the loss and the snuffing out of more than 100 million souls. And that was just at the hands of communists, not to mention what National Socialism did. And so though ISIS can seem very far removed from those kind of ideologies, it's born of the same spirit, which is to say we can begin things over 
we'll recreate human beings, we'll have a new heaven on earth, and we're going to do it by force. Yes? Thank you so much for uh, speaking to the Pachyderm Club. It's wonderful to see someone as young as you uh, have the depth of understanding of civics that you appear to have. I have two questions. One is related to ISIS, what you were just speaking about. I got an email from um, the American Minute that says that since the rise of ISIS, we have more people under slavery than this planet has ever seen before. And I, I just can't imagine that being mm. accurate. But it, this is what, of course, be mostly female slaves, uh, Yazidi women, Christian women, and so on, uh, under ISIS. Is that accurate? My second question is more of an opinion. Who is our best president ever and why? <laughs> That's great. Uh, next question. <laughs> no, that. That's a, those are both uh, uh, terrific questions. On the first, I'll have to plead ignorance on whether, in fact, we're at an all-time high in terms of uh, human enslavement. I, I, my, my suspicion is that that is not accurate in terms of total numbers globally. Um, however, I do know that we're at an all-time high in terms of human uh, history, in terms of the number of refugees. And that, which stands nearly at 100 million, um, is, is a staggering number. And it, it uh, has coincided roughly, uh, of course, with the rise of ISIS and the absolute uh, deterioration of, of, uh, of, of things in the, in the Middle East. As for our greatest president, uh, you know, if you look at something like John Ford's The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, there's two presidents that hang in that little schoolroom. Uh, uh, and, and so many of um, our, our schools used to do this and only this, not just at President's Day, but year round. They'd have George Washington and they'd have Abraham Lincoln. And today we just marked President's Day and President's Day isn't actually a thing and it shouldn't be because not all of our presidents are equal and it's certainly not worthy of celebrating them all as if they were. And every year or every few years there's a ranking that, that historians do. And I think somebody that is really highly neglected, so I'd put Washington and Lincoln in, in, uh, in the top tier, but I'd also include Calvin Coolidge. I've really, uh, as of late, become an even bigger fan of, of, of Coolidge and, and his appreciation of the principles of the Declaration and his ability to, when you think of um, how much we've added in the last uh, uh, two presidents to our national debt, it's more than doubled when you take uh, everything in. More than doubled. I mean, by the time that President Obama is done, it may exceed $20 trillion, right? But it piled up pretty quickly under George W. Bush as well. And under Calvin Coolidge, it did not. In fact, he was able to turn uh, uh, that ship around. And, and I think there's, there's uh, uh, so much to be said for uh, for other occupants of the Oval Office, I'm sure uh, there, are, there are other favorites out there, but um, those, are, those are three presidents that I, that I admire a lot. Recently, the Kansas legislature has been dealing with uh, supporting or not supporting the Convention of States. Mm -hmm. what, is, what are your thoughts about the Convention of States? Yeah, it's intriguing, and I think that, that uh, the, the movement that in part uh, Mark Levin touched off uh, with, with his book uh, has some, some, some promise. Here, here are two concerns that I have, and I know one of them, um, there, there's, a, there's a ready response by those who support the Convention of the States, but it is a very easy thing to say that you're going to have an airtight arrangement for any sort of constitutional convention. But that's precisely what those who framed the first Constitutional Convention thought they had. You know, the charge of those delegates going off to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia was to amend the Articles of Confederation. And very quickly, what Madison saw is that necessity demanded that they dispense with the Articles of Confederation and they start anew. Now, I know there's, there's a response on, on that uh, question and how you would ensure that there's not going to be a runaway convention. But here's the question that I, that I wonder about. To what end? What's the Convention of the States going to be able to do? Because a lot of times the goal is a balanced budget amendment. And you know, a lot of our states have balanced budget amendments, and they don't have balanced budgets. It is a very difficult thing to think that any sort of parchment barrier right, is going to be enough to compel the kind of action that we need. And so sometimes I worry about all of the effort that is being put in, put in this direction, when the harder work, actually, is just trying to get in there, roll up your sleeves, and get involved in elections, and elect good people who are going to have the will 
to do these things. So the question is, what do we want the Convention of the States to really accomplish? And if it's beyond a balanced budget amendment, then I'd, I'd wonder whether it's really going to be able to do what it, what it uh, purports that it's going to do. I've had uh, family members, in, both in high school and college, mm -hmm. that have been exposed to uh, professors or teachers who actually are not teaching anything about mm -hmm. the, the good about our country, but the bad about our country. Yeah. Do you have any solution that you, I've seen my granddaughters even turn away from capitalistic thoughts to socialism? Mm -hmm. and it's because they're being brainwashed. Do you have any solution to this? Yeah, it's, it's I think, a, a, a pretty widespread phenomenon. The person I mentioned, a historian who uh, died a number of years ago, but who's written one of the best-selling textbooks, Howard Zinn, was uh, a self-described anarcho-Marxist. And he wrote a book that, that kind of commemorates that viewpoint. And it's a rip-roaring good story. Uh, he tells a lot of, of, of heroes, and they're not the typical heroes, they're those who opposed uh, the march of free markets, those who opposed uh, many of the institutions that today we have come uh, to, to respect. But what he does is he crafts this sort of narrative arc, and students are pulled into that, and teachers as well. And Howard Zinn appeared on uh, the television show that Jon Stewart hosted for, for a decade. And Stewart asked uh, this, uh, this uh, historian, you know, have you seen, because your, your books sort of allege that America has gotten worse over time, not any better, and that it started off really low and bad anyway, <laughs> that the founders were all about themselves and feathering their own nests and people that look like them, that is, rich, privileged, white people. That's what the American founding was about. Has it gotten any better throughout American history? And Zinn paused for a moment, and he said, no. And even John Stewart was kind of amazed by that response. And so there are, there are teachers who adopt that viewpoint. There are schools. Many of our best private schools, those who are college preparatory, are in that camp, I would say. I was at one where tuition runs uh, $40,000 a year per student. Uh, this was in the state of Florida. And it had in its library definitions of various political ideologies, communism, was, and I quote, where everyone shares everything equally and all have the same. Students do not know who Alexander Solzhenitsyn was. They don't know who Margaret Thatcher was. They have no sense that Ronald Reagan was anything other than an amiable dunce. They think that the Cold War was really a clash of equals. And if they know anything about that, it's a real, that is about the Cold War at all. Beyond that, it's a real surprise. And so for them, socialism seems like it was invented yesterday. And thus, there's a kind of intoxicating newness to it. And I think what we have to do better, for those of us who care about civic education, is show that we are future looking, that we are not mired in the past, however much importance we give to the past and learning from it but that in fact civic education is about applying those principles to today's problems and making it very real in the lives of your grandkids and others like those. Because what they're presented with as an alternative gives them solutions, or at least what look to be like solutions. And that has always been intoxicating to youth. That's, that's one of those things that it's not just this, this generation, but every one. But right now they can so easily meet that kind of uh, experience in high school. Because even if they don't get it from their teachers, it's out there in the ether. And that's the kind of air that they're breathing. And so we have to change the climate in which these debates are happening. And what we do with our teachers is to challenge them, regardless of where they are on the ideological spectrum, to present things in a fair way. So for example, if you're going to look at the Great Depression, and you're going to look at the thesis that FDR got us out of the Great Depression through the New Deal, well, you should look at the historical scholarship that suggests the opposite, that in fact the New Deal might have prolonged the Great Depression, and that you present both in terms that the students and anybody looking at that would say, yeah, that's a fair perspective. I taught a course at Boston College, and it was all about the most uh, contentious issues in society. So every week we would tackle uh, an issue like abortion or um, uh, the right, welfare rights. We looked at the Second Amendment. 
And that was a particularly tough one for this group of students. And so I sensed there were some that came out and they said, you know what, I find the viewpoint espoused by the National Rifle Association so awful that I cannot even uh, um, uh, humor the idea of, of saying those things. And to that student and that group of students, I, I said, well, very well, you just earned yourself representing them tomorrow in class. You are going to represent the position of the NRA. And then for those students who were left, I said, you're going to represent the position of those who oppose the NRA, Handgun Control Inc. and others like that group. And this is not to turn them into sophists where they don't care about the truth. It is to say that the first step in being a citizen is to understand that there are different positions than your own. And that if you can articulate and know those things, then you can, and at that point, come to an adjudication of what is true and what is false. And so if we can ask our fellow citizens across uh, uh, the ideological spectrum to come to at least an agreement that we should have a civil discourse and that we should model that for our students, at least there's a, uh, a hope of, of, of turning this thing around. Dr. David Bob, let's give him a chance. Thank you. Thank you much.